Welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Laura Lovers and I am the Chief Scientific Officer of Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy or CURE. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. November is Epilepsy Awareness Month and we are very excited to present the second in our series of five webinars during this month that highlights some of the key research that's being done on epilepsy. Today's webinar will focus on epilepsy devices and technology presented by Dr. Bob Fisher. On November 15th, we will have Dr. Jeff Nobles from Baylor College present on infantile spasms. On November 21st, Dr. Ramon Diaz Aristea from the University of Pennsylvania will present on post-traumatic epilepsy and during the last week of November, on the 29th, Dr. Elizabeth Donner from the University of Toronto will present on Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy, or SUDEP. All of these webinars are at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. For those of you who may not be familiar with CURE, our mission is to cure epilepsy, not just treat it. We seek to transform and save the millions of lives who are affected by epilepsy. We identify and fund cutting-edge research, challenging scientists worldwide to collaborate and innovate in pursuit of our goal. We are one of the largest private funders of epilepsy research in the world, funding over 200 research projects in 15 countries. CURE has been the pioneer in many areas of epilepsy research, including SUDEP, where we have invested over $4 million into research. CURE has also worked to accelerate the understanding of infantile spasms, a catastrophic form of childhood epilepsy that can significantly impact a child's development and leave lifelong disability. We also realize that anyone is at risk for developing epilepsy because it can be acquired over time and as a result of brain injury. We have just launched a new project funded by a grant from the U.S. Department of Defense that supports a team approach to understanding post-traumatic epilepsy. CURE is also excited to support the development of an Apple iPhone app called EpiWatch. This is the first, the first version of this app is already available for download and helps people track their seizures, as well as allows the person to send an alert to a caregiver that a seizure is happening. It also helps track medications and potential triggers for seizures. CURE is partnering with investigators at Johns Hopkins University to help them develop the next generation of the app that will hopefully detect seizures and automatically send an alert to caregivers. Of course, the development of this version of the app requires research and data from those who have epilepsy. CURE is supporting this research by providing donated Apple Watches to those who are eligible to participate in the research. Individuals must own an Apple iPhone that is capable of running the latest operating system, must be 16 years of, of age or older, have epilepsy, and have had at least one tonic-clonic seizure in the past year. For the research study, it's also important that participants have no physical or learning disabilities that would impair the ability to interact with the app, but family members and caregivers may be able to help you carry out some of the activities of the study. Please stay tuned for more information at the end of the webinar for details on how you or a loved one can learn more and potentially participate in the WATCH donation program and research study. EpiWatch is just one of the technologies that is in development to improve the lives of those with epilepsy. Today, we have Dr. Robert Fisher, who will talk to us further about the newest devices and technologies that are in development. Dr. Fisher is the Masla Saul, MD Professor and Director of the Stanford Epilepsy Center and EEG Lab. He's published over 200 peer-reviewed articles and three books. He's received numerous awards for his work, both nationally and internationally, and is a past president of the American Epilepsy Society. He's been involved in clinical trials on deep brain stimulation for epilepsy and on the next generation vagus nerve stimulation devices. His recent research is on new devices to detect and treat seizures. Dr. Fisher has won many teaching awards and also has an active clinical practice at the Stanford Epilepsy Clinic. Before Dr. Fisher begins, I'd like to encourage everyone to be thinking about and asking questions. You may submit, submit your questions anytime during the presentation by typing them into the questions tab of the GoToWebinar control panel and clicking send. 
My colleague from CURE, Brandon Lachlan, will read them aloud during the Q&A portion of the webinar. We do want this webinar to be as interactive and as informative as possible. However, to respect everyone's privacy, we ask that you make your questions general and not specific to a loved one's ep epilepsy. We also want to mention that today's webinar, as well as last week's well webinar and the ones to come, will be recorded and available on the CURE website. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Fisher. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, I see there are 77 of us online now, and that number keeps uh, increasing. Uh, please do think of questions or comments. Uh, please uh, don't refer specifically, as you uh, heard, to your own case, but make them general. Uh, and try to keep them brief, and in turn, I'll try to keep my answers brief so that people have a chance uh, to ask questions. We'll be talking today about devices for treating epilepsy. I wanted to make some disclosures because I have some relationships with uh, companies. I haven't actually had any income from any of these, but potentially I could. So take a moment to uh, note the uh, potential conflicts uh, of interest, although I'm not uh, selling any product uh, here on this uh, webinar. So we're talking about devices. Uh, drugs are the mainstay of treatment for people with epilepsy. Uh, you all know that. But what's wrong with drugs? Well, they only work in two-thirds of people with epilepsy. They have side effects, particularly memory problems, fatigue, moodiness, dizziness, gastrointestinal upset, uh, etc. They have long-term side effects, such as osteoporosis, which is bone loss, sometimes weight gain or weight loss, cholesterol increases. In women of childbearing years, they sometimes can cause birth defects. Uh, they're inconvenient to take. There's a risk of forgetting to take them, and they can be quite expensive. Therefore, there are devices. On this slide, I give examples of six existing devices that can be used now. And on the next slide, I'll show you some future devices. Uh, existing devices include vagus nerve stimulation, uh, shape watches, uh, laser surgery, cyber knife radio surgery, seizure diaries, and the implanted responsive neurostimulator. Future devices, near future I hope, inhaled medicines, drug infusion directly into the brain tissue or the fluid surrounding the brain, seizure prediction devices, focused ultrasound, deep brain stimulation, and transcranial magnetic stimulation. We won't have time to go into all of these in detail because it's a short webinar, but we can give uh, a brief overview and then we can have some questions and answers on those that, uh, that you wish to go into in more detail. So let's start with uh, seizure alerting or predicting. You heard at the beginning about the EpiWatch uh, in association with Apple. Um, there are several watches that are available that can detect the shaking of a seizure. Uh, one of them, uh, portrayed on the uh, right, and I'm intentionally avoiding brand names here, um, has the interesting uh, characteristic of be being able to record the electrodermal activity, which is the skin resistance or galvanic skin response, uh, the same thing they use in lie detector tests, by the way, uh, and it turns out to uh, increase in many a seizure. The problem with this uh, shake detector philosophy is that it's good for the tonic-clonic seizures, what some of you may know as the grand mal seizures, but it's not good at picking up the complex partial seizures with the loss of awareness, the fumbling, uh, the forgetting, the wandering sometimes. Uh, these seizures are now called uh, focal impaired awareness seizures, by the way. So the uh, uh, game is still uh, not settled for having a biodetector, uh, short of an EEG pasted on your head all the time, that can detect those smaller seizures. But we can detect uh, shake detection seizures. Uh, we can then broadcast uh, to your family member uh, that you are having a seizure and uh, where that uh, seizure is taking place uh, uh, on a map. Now, uh, that's uh, um, a 
Shake watch. There is a recent uh, approved uh, FDA device um, in the United States called the Brain Sentinel that detects uh, rhythmical muscle contraction. Uh, you can see it uh, stuck on the outside of the arm and it picks up the uh, rhythmical muscle contraction uh, so-called electromyogram EMG. There's no needles. It's a surface recording um, and uh, it's approved in the United States as an adjunct to seizure monitoring uh, in patients who are uh, at rest, potentially at home. So first a question to think about. Uh, uh, don't answer uh, on your microphone, but you should be able to interact uh, with the uh, chat box. Uh, have you uh, tried one of the shake detection watches uh, or a shake detection application on one of your smartphones? If so, how did it work? Seizure prediction. This has been a goal for a long time. Many of my patients tell me that one of the most difficult aspects of having epilepsy is the unpredictability of seizures. Can you imagine this scenario? Beep, beep, beep. A belt device tells you you're likely to have a seizure in the next 10 minutes. Make yourself safe and put a pill under your tongue. That is currently fantasy, but I think not for long. There has been a device which completed a clinical trial, the citation I list above, uh, Cook in Lancet Neurology, all the way back in 2013. Uh, this device is a seizure prediction device. It does involve implanting electrodes, not in the brain, but over the brain. Um, under the bone. So it is uh, an invasive uh, monitor and then it connects all under the skin to a device under the skin of the chest which can radio broadcast to a belt paging device. And although it can give you a noise warning, it also can show you red for impending seizure and blue for in the clear with white being neutral. So here's a recording from the study by Cook. Each row is a day in the life of the patient wearing the monitor. You can see uh, that uh, there are several periods of red on the bar. These are warning periods and the red arrows are times when there were actual clinical seizures. All of the red arrows in this patient happened at times when there was a warning. There are some other warnings that don't have red arrows and perhaps those were little electrical seizures that didn't really come to notice but might have been seizures as well. So uh, this uh, technology um, has not yet been uh, brought to market mostly for business reasons uh, but my hope is that this and even better technology because computers are getting smarter and faster all the time will soon be able to to tell at least some of you when you are likely to have a seizure so that you can do something about it. Sit down, not drive, take an extra pill, etc. There will soon be a variety of new EEG equipment that doesn't require pasting things on the head, and doesn't require uh, wires, but will just be able to be worn like a cap and I imagine that that may make monitoring quite a bit easier because an EEG monitor can pick up the smaller seizures, the, the focal impaired awareness seizures that don't involve shaking. It's just at the current time not feasible to go around all the time uh, with an EEG monitor on your head. Other detection devices Every time I give this talk, I get asked about seizure alert dogs. There are some people who are uh, quite convinced that dogs can uh, alert them of seizures, uh, whether they can do that in significant advance of the seizure or just at the start of the seizure, I think is still a little bit uh, debatable. It's uh, possible that the cats could uh, uh, detect or predict seizures as well. Uh, I don't know, but I have a feeling if they could, they would probably not tell you anyway. So question, uh, would it help you to be able to predict when a seizure will occur and uh, can you do this already? 
Diaries, clinical information systems. There are several of them, My Epilepsy Diary and the Epilepsy Foundation, My Seizure Diary, um, Seizure Tracker, uh, which the Moss family uh, developed, uh, Diaries with Patients Like Me, and several others. Uh, these are very important because the biggest problem that we physicians have in caring for people with epilepsy is poor information. We don't really know how many seizures you're having most of the time. We don't know how strong they are, what type of seizure, what time of day they're occurring, what the triggering factors might be, uh, and whether they're happening because um, medication levels are low in your system. So anything that creates better information or better record keeping will help us to take better care of our patients. Furthermore, this kind of information is critical as we do epilepsy research to try to invent better pills and better devices uh, for seizures. If we don't know how well they're working, we don't know how to proceed. The fallibility of diaries was brought home to me in a study uh, that we did uh, in the Stanford Epilepsy Monitoring Unit a year or so ago where we were looking to see if a shake watch could communicate with a diary in the sky automatically to record tonic-clonic seizures. And uh, we wanted to compare that with a bedside uh, paper diary that we asked the patients to collect. Well, the watch captured 12 out of 13 of the shake seizures, and the number of those seizures that were recorded in the bedside diary, amazingly, was zero. Uh, in many cases, the patients, when asked, said, yes, I had a seizure, but it just was not recorded in the diary. So I think we've got a ways to go in order to get better information about people's seizures, and I'm hopeful that uh, technology in the near future may help us with that. Possible future. I adapted a cartoon from McCracken. Uh, we're going to run a few tests to pin down the cause of your seizures. I made up the caption. But you see a patient with a, a shake detector on the wrist, which goes to automatic seizure tracking to the internet cloud. There's also some method of automatic tracking of medication blood levels. And that all comes together for information to give feedback to the doctor and the patient. And at some point, this may be a closed loop where it even can give treatment uh, to the patient on the basis of automatic tracking and detection, uh, but that is uh, somewhat off in the future. Questions then, do you always know when your seizures occur? And what are the issues that you have with logging in a diary? Why don't diaries work better than they do? New ways of drug delivery. I think you all know about pills, about injections, about the uh, rectal diazepam. Um, more convenient uh, will be coming up in the near future, I think, some nasal sprays of medications and some inhaled medications, uh, like with asthma puffer uh, kinds of devices. Some of these will work very quickly and will be of use in two circumstances. One, if you happen to be fortunate enough to have an aura, a warning, and you're not immobilized during that time, you may be able to uh, puff a medication to head a seizure off. And secondly, if you have seizure clusters, you know you have one seizure, you're probably going to have more, then you'll be able to take a medication that would work quickly to head off uh, the cluster of seizures, what I call cluster busters. More intense, and for people who obviously have uh, severe and uncontrolled epilepsy, uh, is the possibility of delivering seizure medications directly to the seizure focus in the brain. Doing this will enable a steady level of medication on a focus rather than the peaks and valleys that many people have when they take pills intermittently. And it also will allow relatively high concentrations of the medicines because you won't be dealing with body side effects, uh, blood pressure, kidney stones, uh, nausea, but you can treat right where the problem is. Well, a pilot trial uh, of this type of therapy, injecting medicines into the cerebrospinal fluid, has been begun in Australia and um, is, is underway, um, initially promising. Uh, but uh, more to report in the near future when we see how this turns uh, out. However, I think there's a good chance 
that this may become a very useful therapy for a small number of people of, who can benefit uh, by it. So new ways of doing, doing surgery. This could be a lecture in itself, but let me just mention three of them that uh, have the field somewhat excited. Uh, one is uh, radiosurgery. Radiation has been used for tumors for a long time. It's been considered for epilepsy, but radiation can have damaging effects on the brain, sometimes long term. So there are new devices, uh, gamma knife, uh, and the newest uh, cyber knife, uh, stereotactic radio surgery, that can focus the radio therapy beam on the part of the brain uh, that needs to be uh, treated. Uh, very often, a temporal lobe or the inner part of the temporal lobe, hippocampus, in people with uh, with epilepsy. Um, this has uh, been shown in the study to be effective, although it is not caught on in a big way uh, because of the potential long-term risks of uh, radiation. Surgery is increasingly being done in the epilepsy world and neurosurgery in general with a laser fiber. I have been asked this for 30 years. Uh, can my surgery be done with a laser? And the answer has always been no until the past uh, couple of years, and now the answer is yes. Uh, you see a, um, a glowing laser fiber, which becomes hot on the tip, it's introduced, typically if we're, say, dealing with temporal lobe uh, epilepsy, through a small opening in the back, uh, a guide needle. The laser fiber goes in and then heats up at the tip. This is done right in an MRI scanner. So the heat signature ball can be seen in real time in order to make sure that the laser fiber is in the correct place. Then you can pull back a bit, make another ball, uh, that heat signature ball is actually removing the tissue, just as a surgeon would. And then when you're done, you pull the laser fiber out. Uh, typically, you're home the next day. A bone has not been opened, and brain has not been removed in order to get down to the area where we want to do the surgery. Preliminary uh, study of this, and this is available and happening in the United States now, uh, suggests that uh, at least for um, mesial temporal lobe epilepsy uh, causing uh, complex partial or focal impaired awareness seizures, uh, that the outcome is almost as good as with open surgery. The recovery is much faster and the cognitive status, the thinking and the word memory um, afterwards in, in dominant hemisphere particularly are better with the laser fiber. And if the laser fiber doesn't quite do the job, it is uh, always possible to go back later and do a conventional uh, open surgery to take out more. So have any of you had epilepsy surgery with a new laser? How did it work? The last section to talk about today is uh, the area of neurostimulation. There are several varieties of that. The one that's been around the longest has been vagus nerve stimulation. So VNS, or vagus nerve stimulation, here, trigger mouse here. Vagus nerve stimulation um, reduces uh, seizures by about an average of 50% at two years. Uh, some people are not helped at all, and a few people are become, become seizure free. It's quite rare to be able to get completely off medications. Uh, with VNS, even if it's working well, uh, but often medications can be uh, reduced. So uh, VNS has no drug-like side effects. It does have some irritating effects sometimes on the, on the throat, making hoarseness or a cough when the stimulator is on. It can be adjusted up or down for effect, uh, like pill dosing. It can be removed if it's not effective. It's also helpful uh, and uh, licensed for treatment of depression. Uh, the battery device uh, typically lasts about five years, depending upon the setting, and uh, then it has to be replaced. Um, the usual stimulation is on for 30 seconds and off for five minutes on regular cycling. If a person feels an aura, they can uh, swipe a magnet over their chest where the device stimulator is and activate the on cycle immediately. The new wrinkle with the vagus nerve stimulation 
is an additional ability to stimulate at a time when the heart rate increases. This is useful because most seizures cause a heart rate increase and on this slide there's an example. This row at the bottom is, is the ECG for the heart rate which increases from 80 beats per minute to 96 beats per minute. The device in this case is set at a threshold to detect that so stimulation comes on and the EEG here which shows rhythmic activity of a seizure when the stimulator comes on interrupts the seizure. Now it doesn't always work that well but it sometimes does. So this is what engineers called closed loop or detect and stimulate mode. It detects the heart rate increase and then stimulates. Of course it will detect many other times when the heart rate goes up. Perhaps you're running up a flight of stairs. Turns out the heart rate increases faster at the start of a seizure than with many other activities such as exercise and so the device takes that into account but there's really no harm done if the device goes off uh, as you're running up the stairs. So have you tried vagus nerve stimulation? Not necessarily the heart rate sensing newest form uh, but any form and how did it work for you? So now we come to a couple of varieties of brain stimulation. Uh, there's the uh, Medtronic uh, Sante trial, uh, which, which I led, stimulation of the anterior nucleus of thalamus for epilepsy. The thalamus is a pacemaker area deep in brain that controls electrical activity of a lot of the brain, uh, particularly temporal lobes and frontal lobes, which is where most seizures originate. So stimulation on a regular five minute cycle, or really six minute cycle, on for one minute and off for five minutes uh, is what's done in the trial and in practice. And uh, this was shown to be effective versus placebo in a randomized large trial. And by um, four years, the seizures on the average are reduced to about one third of what they were before, uh, with some people becoming seizure free. Uh, this uh, treatment uh, which does require uh, brain implantation and connecting the wires under the skin to a chest stimulator. Is approved in 30 countries but not yet the United States, although I'm hopeful it will be approved within the United States uh, reasonably soon. This shows the improvement over time. In the double-blinded uh, controlled scientific phase, there was a 40 percent improvement uh, in seizures in the first three months of stimulation, which was uh, more than the 15% improvement seen in a placebo group. And it keeps getting better over time to about 70% uh, improvement uh, by five to seven years. Now, another type of stimulation is responsive neurostimulation, uh, which is sometimes known by the company name Neuropace. Uh, this uh, device is approved and is currently being uh, implanted in patients in the United States and it is covered by insurance in most cases. Um, instead of implanting the device in the chest, the company chose to build it uh, directly into the skull. In order to do neuropace stimulation, your medical team needs to know where your seizures are coming from. There have to be no more than two places because there are two leads available on the device currently. And presumably it is a place that um, would not be amenable to being removed by surgery or you don't want it removed. So in this case, the Neuropace device is just implanted over a seizure focus or alternately you can use a depth wire to implant it uh, in a seizure focus, for example, a hippocampus inside the temporal lobe. The device is then trained to recognize your specific EEG pattern during a seizure, such as we see here, and then give an electrical stimulation to counteract the seizure. It's rather analogous to the defibrillator device that you may have heard of in the heart that is implanted to detect uh, an abnormal and dangerous heart rhythm and give the heart a shock to shock it back to a normal rhythm. Similar thing, but done with the brain. So this is a device that's not curative and it does require brain surgery, so it's invasive. 
but it, um, it can sometimes be very helpful uh, for seizures. Um, this stimulator will last anything from two to ten years, also typically about five years depending upon setting, and then the whole thing needs to be replaced uh, with an operation uh, at the skull. This shows the results, the drop of the seizures in the blinded phase uh, with use of stimulation and the maintenance uh, and improvement to about the same level um, as with the thalamic deep brain stimulator uh, by five years. This is important because if you had uh, benefit for seizures just for a year or two that then wore off, uh, it would not be worth uh, implanting a device. But the benefit seems not only to be lasting, uh, but to uh, improve over time. Now, of course, these are devices in your head that we're talking about, so there can be side effects. There's a risk for bleeding. Fortunately, that hasn't usually been a significant problem, and the chances of serious bleeding are well under 1% in experienced hands. Uh, the device can be infected, which may require antibiotics or replacement of the device. The electrodes may need replacement. There can be tingling with stimulation. There's the need for battery device uh, replacement. And sometimes uh, it doesn't help the seizures or rarely uh, may make them worse. Question, have you tried a responsive neurostimulation device such as Neuropace? Unless you're from Canada or Europe, I don't think you would have tried the deep brain stimulation device yet. Um, and how did it work for you? I'd like to make mention too of transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is not approved for treatment of epilepsy. It is approved in the United States for treatment of refractory depression. But the important feature of it is that it doesn't involve drilling any holes in the head or putting any wires in the head or in or on the brain. Um, it's magnetic uh, pulses uh, externally. Uh, some studies have been positive, meaning favorable for epilepsy, and some have been uh, negative. And uh, those of us in this research area are still working out uh, how to make them uh, most positive. Uh, this is an example of the most positive trial, which was done in uh, uh, Beijing, uh, China. And uh, you can see that, that a seizure frequency here, when the two weeks of daily stimulation comes on, uh, plummets to about 20% of the baseline level, whereas the placebo fake stimulation uh, does not have any effect on seizure frequency. So this is not yet ready for prime time, but this, this approach uh, is a hopeful one, non-invasive neurostimulation. The conclusions then are that devices offer alternatives to medicines. Devices and medicines are not mutually exclusive, but can be used together. When a device works well, it may be possible to cut down medicines and reduce side effects. The device side effects are different from the medication side effects. In the United States, several devices are available, and future neurostimulators, seizure predictors, local drug delivery devices, and new neurosurgery methods are likely to emerge over the next five years and uh, should provide new opportunities uh, for people whose epilepsy is not controlled by medications. At this point, I will turn the program uh, back over to uh, Cure to uh, organize uh, any questions, answers, and comments. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Fisher. Uh, we really appreciate all of the information and uh, the overview of so many different technologies. We'll now begin the Q&A session. Again, if you have questions, please submit them in the Questions tab of the GoToWebinar control panel and click Send. And Brandon can then go ahead and read them aloud. Hopefully, there have been uh, some questions that have already come on. Brandon, would you like to, uh, to speak to those? Sure. Um, yeah, actually, the first question um, uh, made mention of some of your last uh, last slides there, Dr. Fisher, um, about FDA approval, and um, and they wanted to know: Are there do all devices have to undergo uh, FDA approval, and why does the process seem to be um, much longer in the U.S.? The FDA. Uh classifies devices as type 1, 2, or 3. Um, 
Type 1 might be a tongue depressor or a bedpan. Um, those devices do not have to go through approval processes. Uh, type 2 has uh, some risk. Um, uh, type 3 is high risk. So uh, a implanted uh, brain device would, would be in the type 3 category, which would be high risk. And those uh, require uh, pretty extensive uh, evidence of uh, safety and efficacy uh, in uh, medical trials. Um, it probably does take the FDA longer uh, to approve uh, drugs and devices uh, than may occur in some other uh, countries. Um, I can't speak really for the FDA. Uh, I, uh, I can only say that they require a device to be safe, effective, and that the benefit should be uh, clinically uh, meaningful. Um, I think that all of the devices that I talked about today um, have that uh, potential, uh, but I can't promise that uh, all of them will be approved, and I, I can never really speak for the FDA's timeline. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. Um, is there any studies going on, or do we know if wearable devices will ever be able to predict um, non-convulsive seizures? I think wearable devices will be able to predict non-convulsive seizures. Uh, we're uh, looking for good ideas and good strategies on that. Um, I think we can take advantage of tailoring an intelligent device to a person's particular seizure type. Uh, let's imagine, for example, that uh, someone has uh, complex partial seizures, and I apologize for the name change. Uh, seizure names just changed this year. Uh, so that's also a focal impaired awareness seizure. Could be a subject for another webinar. And the uh, person might always say, help me, help me, help me, or some stock phrase at the start of a seizure. So obviously then we could tailor a device to recognize that um, at the start. Now in terms of prediction, it's a little bit harder. Mostly that seems to be based on uh, EEG. Some studies say measures of brain blood flow. Uh, can be used for prediction. Uh, so uh, we're still looking for uh, a way to um, have uh, wearable uh, predictive devices uh, that are non-invasive. I think we can probably do it with invasive and maybe we can do it with non-invasive. Great, thank you. Uh, along the same lines there, um, are there any statistics on actually how predictive uh, wearable devices can be, or is that information really not available yet? Um, by wearable devices, um, mostly we're currently talking about um, shake detector watches um, or the, uh, the shake detector uh, brain sentinel uh, EMG. Um, that uh, uh, Sentinel device had pretty good um, sensitivity for picking up uh, seizures. Uh, the watches usually have pretty good sensitivity, meaning they pick up the shaking, but they also pick up a large number of non-seizure events, like, for example, brushing your teeth. Uh, and when that's uh, the case, uh, the devices can have a cancel button. Uh, because the watch can start beeping before it sends a broadcast that a seizure occurs and the person can say, no, that's not a seizure, I'm just brushing my teeth and hit the cancel button. So if you uh, use the uh, cancel function, then both the sensitivity and the specificity of these devices in small studies can be above 75-80%. Now, large studies like the uh, EpiWatch Apple study uh, will give us the more definitive answer to the question you asked. Great, thank you. Um, do you know if after you've had uh, invasive surgery, um, if laser surgery in the future would still be an option? If there's tissue remaining behind, uh, then laser surgery is indeed uh, an option. Uh, we've, uh, at our institution, uh, done laser surgery as repeat surgery. It's worked out well in, in a few cases. Uh, we've even used it um, to complete a corpus callosum resection, a split brain uh, operation, where there was some remnant of the corpus callosum uh, in the back part of the brain. So uh, the key to laser surgery is that 
you have to have a pretty localized uh, area uh, to remove. You're not going to be able to use the laser to take out a whole lobe, for example. Great. Uh, next question. Is NeuroPACE approved for children um, such as under 12 years old? I will let the NeuroPACE uh, people speak to that. Uh, I'm afraid I might get their indication uh, wrong. Okay. Um, and uh, next question. What is the reduction of VNS versus RNS at five years? About 50 percent. In the uh, controlled clinical trials, there were two. Um, the uh, reduction was statistically significant, but fairly small. It was in the 20 to 25 percent rate of reduction. Uh, but just like the deep brain stimulators, as the vagus nerve stimulator stays in uh, for a year, two years, um, it becomes more effective. We're not sure why that is. Because, for example, if you look at neurostimulators in the Parkinson area or in the tremor area, those are immediately effective within a minute of putting them in. So obviously different mechanisms. But by a couple of years VNS, um, half of the people have their seizures cut in half or better uh, and are uh, satisfied with the results. And most people uh, vote um, in the real world uh, to show satisfaction by usually having the stimulator replaced uh, when the battery depletes. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. Um, are there any good devices or, or, or perfect devices that can be used to prevent SUDEP? Oh boy, we, we really want, we really want those. Um, the, the answer is no. The problem is not uh, solved uh, currently. Um, there's much uh, discussion on this. Uh, Cure uh, is taking a major role, if not the lead role. Um, the uh, um, Epilepsy Foundation uh, has also um, just started uh, something called the Epilepsy Innovation uh, Institute, EII, uh, and has uh, started tackling uh, the problem of devices uh, to predict seizures and to reduce the chance of SUDEP as well. Um, a sense is that it's not going to be one single modality device, but that it's probably going to be a device that combines a variety of measures, um, heart, respiration, perhaps uh, EEG, um, perhaps several other uh, uh, features that, that would be useful to, to mention, uh, but we don't have the problem solved yet. Great, thank you. Um, next question, and uh, some more general question. What is the difference between um, therapeutic devices and detection prediction devices? Yeah, so detection prediction or diagnostic devices would be something like an EEG. So an EEG is a diagnostic device. It doesn't, doesn't give therapy. Uh, I did uh, talk mostly about therapeutic devices, but with respect to uh, prediction, I crossed the line a little bit uh, into detection devices because it's so obvious that if you can detect early or predict, then you will be able to take a next step soon after, uh, which is to do something therapeutic about it. Uh, perhaps turn on a neurostimulator, perhaps uh, uh, puff inhale uh, an anti-seizure medicine, uh, or perhaps just sit down for safety. Great. And I believe that is the majority of the questions um, that were asked by our audience today. I did get many comments that people loved your cat joke, by the way, Dr. Fisher, so I did want to oh, okay. mention that as well. We, uh, um, we may have a few minutes if you, if you wish to share any of the comments, since I did uh, ask, uh, I did invite uh, the audience to, to make uh, comments. Uh, uh, I'll leave it up to you, but uh, perhaps you could just uh, read a few of those. Um, I do not um, look through here. I didn't see any specific answers to any of those questions. Okay. People are being shy. People are being shy today, it looks like. so. All right, then. All right. I'll turn it back over to, to Laura.
Great, thank you. Well, I think that there was a great set of questions there, very informative. Uh, this does conclude our um, webinar on epilepsy devices and technology, and I do want to thank everyone for joining us today and for your questions. I want to give a special thank you to Dr. Fisher for sharing your knowledge of epilepsy devices and technologies. If anyone has questions about CURE's research program, please visit our new website at www cure epilepsy that's all one word cure epilepsy dot org or you can email us at info at cure epilepsy dot org that's i n f o at cure uh, you can ask us questions about our research programs and also get more information about the epiwatch program um, that we are currently involved with you can also find more information on the website about cure events during Epilepsy Awareness Month, including the My Shot at Epilepsy campaign. Um, please be sure to register for our next webinar one week from today on November 15th at 2 p.m. Uh, Dr. Jeff Nobles from Baylor College will be joining us to discuss uh, infantile spasms. So again, thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>